Welcome everyone. It's a nice morning here in Birmingham. Um, I hope it's good with you. Um, I'm going to be talking about, um, as you'll see, the acoustic characterization in the workshop, specifically designed for instrument makers to be able to measure um, their instruments at all stages of the making. Um, I've said it's a dongle, and it, that means two things in my mind. A dongle is something that you actually use to make things possible when you attach it to a computer, and it's a dongle because it's relatively simple, as I hope I'll be able to show you. So what I'm going to be doing is um, showing how you can make measurements inside the, inside, sorry, inside the, the, the violin cavity to measure the acoustic properties. And I'll show that they're related, in fact, to the um, radiated acoustic properties. So you're measuring something useful about the sound of the instrument um, uh, in what is actually a quick and easy to use and very inexpensive method for the acoustic characterizations of all instruments in the violin family. And it can be all sorts of other instruments as well, of course. And it's ideally suited to routine characterization of plates and the assembled instruments. I'm not going to be able to talk, to talk about plates today, today but I mean, um, I can do that separately. Um, it can be used, therefore, during the making and the setup and the restoration of, of instruments. And the great advantage of the, the method is, one, that it's not expensive, it's easy to use, but very importantly, it's not found affected in any way by the surrounding acoustics of the workshop or the performance space. Or, or no, noise, it's because you're measuring inside the instrument, very little sound from outside gets inside. So what I'm going to do is to talk about um, the cavity modes themselves to start with, so we know what they are. And then I'm going to describe an um, uh, inexpensive characterization setup, which is based on small miniature electric microphones, which are, which are very small. They're about five millimeters or so in size which you can insert through the F holes to make the measurements. And I should give you some examples for the violin, viola, cello, and double bass, because the great thing about measurements like this, you don't have to, you can measure the acoustic properties of an instrument like a double bass without having an anarchic chamber that, that is so large that it's like, almost like a concert hall um, to put it in. So it can, it can be done actually within the, within the workshop, which is, an advantage, one hopes. Anyway. Now, these are computed <clears throat> pictures of the air modes inside a Titian strad, going around the inside <clears throat> of the ribs, <clears throat> the corner blocks and, and the end blocks. And the lowest mode is this mode that we call the A0 mode, which corresponds to the pressure variations inside the cavity um, that comes from the um, motion of air in and out of the F holes. Uh, the lines are lines that are superimposed of equal pressure contours. And you can see, although the simple model textbook says it's constant throughout the cavity, it isn't because you've got air flowing from the two ends and um, it's comparable with the wavelength of sound. So you get a change in pressure as the air flows from the ends. So it's higher at the two ends and obviously lowest at the middle, but very high when it rushes out through the F holes. That's why you see those very dark bands. The next mode, that, that's around about 300 Hertz. The next mode is the A1 mode, which is a sloshing mode with the air bouncing backwards and forwards from one end of the instrument to the other. Uh, <clears throat> and again, the, um, you get a high pressure at the ends um, because blue is high pressure one way and red is high pressure the other way, and green and yellow are very close to zero. So there's very little sound actually gets out from this mode um, through the F holes. The next mode is, is the A2 mode, where I, the sound is now sloshing backwards and forwards across the lower bouts with almost no activity at all in the upper bout. Uh, then um, there's an, another mode where there's a whole wavelength along the um, instrument uh, at about 1.2 kilohertz, 
And that corresponds to a maximum. So as you can see, that red color near the F holes means that that in principle can radiate sound out through the F hole in just the same way as the, the A naught does to give you a very important A naught resonance. Um, which Colin? Is, yes? Colin, just because uh, new people and some people didn't listen to your previous talk, just want to clarify some people are asking what is computed? Just saying that it's a this, 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 yes, this computer is, this, model. These, it says so on the slide, they're the computed air modes for Titian Stroud. Right? Yes, but some people don't understand what means computed. Uh, well, it's, it's okay. It's what's called finite element um, computations where, where you, you actually model the air inside and you work out, in fact, what the pressures are when you set up waves in it. And I don't want to go into more detail than that, okay? So, so co computers are very useful for doing this sort of thing and for, for modeling what's happened. But the, the, the important thing is um, these modes that you compute, not surprisingly, are very similar to the modes that anyone, if they set out to do the measurements, um, as Aston Folk did a long time ago, um, and he, he found below about four kilohertz, there were about 25 of these modes. And they're the air modes. And you could put a mic, you can put a microphone inside, and you can put a little loudspeaker or some source of sound inside, and you'll find all these resonances of all these modes. And the colors uh, um, are distributions of the pressure inside. Um, the, when the, the pressure, it's, we're talking about the acoustic pressure now from the waves, when it's negative, shall we say, it's blue, and when it's positive, it's red. But every half cycle, the two colors will interchange. Um, and that, then going on, there's um, a wave across the upper bouts, which is at a higher frequency. And this is like, like plates as well. As you can see, because um, the lower bout in the A2 mode, uh, just over a kilohertz, is, in the, in, uh, is the dominant one with nothing in the upper bout. At the higher frequency, you get the same mode now in the upper bout that you had earlier on in the lower bout. Shall I use a pointer here? This is the lower bout, and this is the upper bout. You can see they're mirror images, but they're affected about the, the center. Um, and the, but not, none of these modes have much <clears throat> pressure at the center. So when you do measurements, if you put a microphone in the center, which is what we're going to do, um, you only get um, strong resonances you, if you're measuring them inside, just alone, from, from the, um, the A0 resonance, uh, around about 300 hertz, the um, A3 resonance, just over a kilohertz, and another one up here at, um, uh, at 1.8 kilohertz. So um, <clears throat> what we, and I'm going to show you, in fact, what the pressure variations are like when you go along the length. This is actually from the, from the tailpiece, and this is going up towards the neck inside the instrument, going along the center line, and you can see that the A0 pressure, instead of being like the textbook, being constant, is high, high values at the two ends, but are very low near the notches, near the, um, F holes. Now, you, <clears throat> if you look at, look at the A0 resonance, A, sorry, the A1 resonance, this one here, you can see it's just like a half wave and it has a zero, um, which I'm going to call the acoustic center of the violin. It's almost opposite the F holes, uh, the notches, and um, uh, it has almost equal volumes above and below it. And so these waves are really just like the waves in a pipe. The, the pipe, of course, has got an annual shape and its cross section is changing along. But the, these are just like the half, many numbers of half wavelengths that you have. There's none for the A0. The A1's got one half wavelength. The A2 mode is um, one of these modes that go um, as anti symmetric, it goes um, opposite sign on the two sides of the instrument, but nothing in the middle. Um, the A3 mode is this next mode here with a whole wavelength. Um, then the A5 mode, just again, just like the waves that you put in um, to a pipe closed at both ends, but it's very, very slightly different because of a slightly different amplitudes. Um, <clears throat> all the, the other thing that's important to recognize about these modes, they're actually two dimensional. 
because the, the violin is <clears throat> and the shallow instruments like the all the violin, all the violin family, <clears throat> it has got a rather small dimension between the top and bottom relative to the length. They can't, uh, uh, the low modes can't have any wavelengths across the between the top and back plates, so that these are two-dimensional modes, and uh, provided you're well away from the um, f holes itself, it doesn't matter what height you put a microphone there, you'll get the same result up and down. <laughs> um, when you want to be more sophisticated, you can put the microphone in other places and look at some of the other ways, for example, you could look purposely at this one here, and that, that would actually match the dipole modes, that's the similar sort of modes in the plate. And so you're getting, you'll get some information about um, how those various modes of the plate were vibrating. So the microphone can act as a probe inside to look and see what the, pro the, the plates are doing. Now, what we're going to do today is concentrate on <clears throat> measurements at the acoustic center of the violin, so I say almost opposite the F holes, <clears throat> doesn't matter if we get a, a bit of this signal, because we know what its frequency is, it's very close to 500 hertz. <clears throat> if we're a tiny bit off center, we just get a resonance due to that mode. Right, <clears throat> let me just remind you about how the violin works. <clears throat> this, this is related, of course, to the first talk I gave. And we remember that um, there were some very prominent modes that occur in all the um, measurements of the admittance or anything else, that, um, radiation. And these were the B1 minus and B1 plus modes. This one here, B1 minus, is the breathing mode. B1 plus is the thing that we call the bending mode. Um, and um, there's sometimes you see a signal from the CBR mode, which is the center bouts that twist back, back rotation backwards and forwards. Now, all those modes are excited by the strings. Now, when, when you, that, that's the simple model that I showed without a sound post, without a bass bar, and with very similar arching. But as soon as you change the um, arching, put a bass bar in and put an offset sound post, you mix all these modes together. And what you get then is some modified, these are the original basis modes, but the real modes are mixtures. So, so if I take the CBR mode, that's going to be a mixture of all these three basis modes. And likewise, the B1 minus mode, the, the, what we still loosely call the, the breathing mode, in the assembled violin actually is not simply just the breathing mode, it, it, it's coupled in and has components that are from the CBR mode and also from the bending mode. And the bending mode importantly gets a very strong coupling together with the B1 minus. So you get these two, both these modes, both having the properties of this basic mode and they both give rise to sound. That gives rise to a little bit of sound. And of course, it's the plates themselves. Um, and the other thing about these modes is that although they're mixtures of modes, they are completely non-interacting. They don't make, they, they can vibrate completely independently of each other. So I can, if I could cite this mode, it wouldn't in fact couple together with these other modes. And that's what one sees, they're called normal modes. And it's the resonances of those modes that one actually sees whenever one does a measurement. And it's the radiation, which is the combined radiation, mostly from the, this breathing mode here, that goes out as radiating sound. So that, that's, the, that, that's our understanding these days of what, what makes the, the, the radiated sound, and that's well, well known. Now I'm, now I'm going to go across to what actually happens when you now consider what happens inside the um, violin itself. So all, all, all this side of the picture we talked about, right? But now we, <clears throat> one of the uh, things- Colin, Colin, I yes? think, um, would you mind coming back to the previous slide and explain a bit the difference between normal and basis modes? Some people are getting confused. Well, I'm not surprised. It's a, it, it, I mean, it confuses students when they're, do they're doing this. 
But uh, the, 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 if, if you were there yesterday, when I talked about the actual modes, um, I started off with a very simple model, because that's the way physicists like to do things to start with, to start off with the simplest possible model, um, and then you add your complications. So the very simplest models uh, of a violin are a violin with identical top and back plates connected together by the ribs. And they have um, certain ways of vibrating. And an important one, and the most important one for um, <coughs> the um, sound is the one that actually involves the volume change. So, so the two plates are vibrating opposite like, like this, and they're pushing out air, and that's what gives radiation. Then there's a bending mode um, like this, if I can do it, I can go back a little bit further, bending mode, which is the, the B, um, B1 plus mode, um, which actually doesn't produce, if they're identical top and back plates, any sound at all. And it's likewise too with the twisting mode, which is the CBR mode. So these are what are called the basis modes. Now, um, as soon as you do something to a system, and what you cause is a coupling between these basis modes. You see, um, you'll notice I've been very careful and everything I nowadays do, um, I'm trying careful to write it. I've written the basis modes in terms of lower cap lowercase letters. That's why they're lowercase and uppercase here. What happens is that when you put an offset sound post in or a bass bar, or the plates have got different arching, what happens is that these are no longer separate modes themselves, they make, get mixed together. And they, so that, uh, let's just concentrate on one here, the B1 minus mode, which is the lowest two of the two sort of body modes that are actually radiating sound larger. They are, they involve the couple motions of the breathing mode, the CBR mode, and the B1 plus mode. That's the breathing, bending, and CBR modes. And so this mode here involves all of those but surprisingly, it acts just like a single one of those in the sense that if you do a resonance curve of it, you just get a single resonance. You don't get the resonances from these, you get a resonance from here, and that is a normal mode. And there's a corresponding normal mode that is largely associated with this, the breathing, but it's coupled together with the B1 and B minus CBR. And that's the B1 plus mode. That's another normal mode. And similarly, this CBR mode, which um, by itself is not coupled to anything, but these um, um, coupling, coupling agents like the bass bar and the offset sound post and the, the different arching causes this mode to be now, again, a mixture of these, but mostly with the, the um, CBR mode. So these, these three modes here are the, are the three normal modes that are made out of the three here basis modes. And that's, I think, all we need to know. Is that all right, Claudia? Yes, uh, can I add something? Yes, of course you can. Uh, if you don't so mind us going on for an hour rather than half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, we have time. Um, so yesterday when I did the model uh, analysis uh, talk, I just talked about modes, okay? And by modes, I actually meant normal modes. So that's the mode of the structure, the final structure, your final violin, okay? So basically, yeah. are the modes of a, a simplified structure where the different parts are not coupled together because you don't have the sound post, for example, okay? So you have a simplified violin without sound post, without bass bear, which has normal modes, but which we call here basis modes because they are referred to a simplified structure, okay? And these modes basically will be coupled, uh, exactly what I said yesterday in my talks. I told you about oscillators being coupled, and when they are coupled, they give rise to two modes. Here we have three oscillators, the CBR by one minus B1 plus in uh, small letters, and they basically get coupled because of the bass bar, the sound post and everything, they get coupled and they give, uh, they lead to three new modes, okay, which are the normal modes of the final structure of the complete violin. Okay, does it make sense compared to the questions that have been asked yeah. in the chat? 
Can, can I give another example? The most obvious example is the vibrating strings. Vibrating strings, if they have perfectly nodes, that is a, a completely fixed and completely flexible, though, um, uh, things at the ends that stopped it from moving, um, then that, that would be a normal mode. Then you have the body underneath and the, the bridge on top of the structure that has vibrations of its own, which if the strings weren't there, it would vibrate by itself in a particular way, but it wouldn't make any sound. So you have to have some coupling between things. So it's the coupling that comes between the strings and the body that actually gives rise, in fact, to the sound. And a new set of um, normal modes, in fact, was the string, with, with, which is exciting a little bit of the body modes with it, um, and the, the body modes that have actually got some uh, motion also forced of the strings. And um, uh, so the, the violin is full of these things. If you put a neck on, you've got neck vibrations um, that will be coupled to the rest of the body of the instrument. You've got a tail piece that, that, that um, uh, by itself and the after lengths of the string, for example, would vibrate together, but they, they are also coupled to the body of the instrument. So you can't escape the idea that coupling is very important, but what is important, the, uh, as far as uh, when you look at any results of things like that, the important thing that one actually sees is individual resonances. Those resonances are the resonances of the coupled modes. And they're single resonances, like the re single resonances, the CBR B1 minus B1 plus, but it involves the coupled motion of the, the simple structure that we started with. I, 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 may we move on? Otherwise, we never get anywhere. Okay, okay. So the next thing I want to do is now, and we're going to still be talking about coupled oscillators, um, but I'm not in the math, I don't want to do the mathematics. I've tried here not to do any mathematics, so to blind people. But what actually happens when these plates are vibrating, um, they're, they're pressing on the air inside, um, they're making sound, that's the radiated sound out here, um, but they're also causing pressure vibrations inside the cavity. Now, um, the, <clears throat> that cavity, can support three more basis modes, which we've been talking about. These are the cavity modes inside the instrument. The A0, notice lowercase, A3, A6, lowercase. They, these are the basis modes of the air vibrating backwards and forwards inside the cavity. Now, they are causing pressure changes here inside the cavity. And the plates are doing the same thing so that the, the, the plates are giving a pressure inside here that drives these modes, and these modes are putting a pressure back again into this thing because they're, when they're vibrating, they are also pressuring and pressurizing the cavity and causing pressure changes, which then reflects back on the plates. And so, so that what one ends up with is a new coupled system in which um, the mode inside the plate also um, um, have the interaction of the actual plates themselves. So the pressure inside and the pressure in, um, outside are very strongly related. And the, the, because of this, there happens to be a direct relationship, bet, um, particularly at low frequencies, between the pressure inside the cavity and the radiated sound. So if you do measurements inside the cavity, you are actually getting the same information that you would get from the radiated sound. To, again, a physicist's approximation. Uh, in reality, there, there are some little changes, like the fact that the simple models say the pressure inside the cavity is always constant. It isn't. I've shown that already. Um, but, but to a, a good approximation, that, that is actually true. So that make, making measurements inside the instrument is a far simpler thing to do than doing radiation measurements, which you've got, you know, you've got to do it in an, an anarchic chamber, ideally, um, and you've got to have some quite expensive equipment, and, and you've got, bit, um, as we'll see later, 
um, I showed yesterday, at higher frequencies, the sound is going all over the place. And you've got to take some sort of averaging. Um, you, you have to do the same thing inside the instrument, that the modes of the instrument itself inside are very simple. So the, the, what's actually happening, these plates are vibrating and, and they're radiating sound into a mini concert hall, a micro concert hall, which is the inside of the violin. And the, the great thing about the insides of the violins, all violins are roughly the same shape, so they have the same acoustic properties. Whereas if you're li looking at radiated sound, it makes a lot of difference depending whether you're playing the violin in a bathroom or in a, a concert hall, um, a, a church, or um, an, an anaphic chamber. So, so the, one of the advantages of doing measurements inside the instrument is that it's not a real concert hall, but it's something that's pretty constant. So, um, doesn't vary very much from, from one instrument to the other. And the same would be true of, of violas, cellos, and double basses. There, there's much more variation there. Um, so you, you're, you're radiating the sound now into a much, a, a, a well-defined concert hall, if you like. Now, just to, uh, uh, I, I've, um, gone to I've gone through this. In, yes? Be, before you move, you move on, um, just to make sure, so basically the blue modes, small CBR, B1 minus B1 plus, they can only be computed because you can compute without air. You couldn't measure them because no, you no, 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 with no. air. Uh, sorry, no, the, 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 these modes that I've talked about are happening with air. They have air inside them. Otherwise, you'd never have an A0 mode. I know, but I thought that the blue modes, you would do the measure, the, the computation without air. Then you do the computation just with the air, the three modes on the right. And then you can actually, in your computation model, put the two together. Yes. And yes. that's what happened with the coupling. Yes. Yes. And, and the coupling comes entirely through the changes in acoustic pressure inside the volume. The plates are doing it and exciting the, um, the, the plate modes. The, the, the plates are changing the, the pressure inside the volume. And the inside of the volume, as it reacts, is reacting back. In fact, the coupling goes both ways, you see, um, on the plate. So the, these modes here couple back on the, uh, onto the plate modes. Um, the plate modes coupled to the air modes. So you've got, again, two sorts of black coupled oscillators. You've not, not, not got two, but of course you've got, in this particular case, you've got six. Okay? Right. Now, it, um, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing this and doing this because it's um, really rather surprising um, to see what you get. And I, I'm going to start off and see here one of the first experiments that we ever did to look at the, um, the relationship between the sound inside the violin and the sound out of the violin, uh, um, uh, uh, inside and radiated. And this is a notable collection of uh, distinguished researchers. And it's always nice to have a picture of Knut, um, who's no longer, no longer with us. Most of you will recognize Claudia. Um, <laughs> this, this, this is George. This is me at, at, a, at a younger stage, and, and this is, um, sorry, I've lost a name at the moment, but someone put it in for me. Um, Aileen, Aileen. Uh, uh, Aileen, that's right, sorry. Uh, Aileen. Aileen. Aileen, Aileen, yeah, sorry, yeah, just, mind, just a moment. And, and we didn't have an echo chamber, we were having a small meeting together in Cambridge, and we thought what we would do, go outside in the garden. Because a garden is a, is a first approach to, in fact, a, an echo chamber. There are not many echoes. There'll be an echo from this, this house up in the back. But most of the, the, the sound is, is, is not re, re, reverberated back. The only problem about echoes, uh, about, about um, the garden as an echo chamber, is that there are a number of birds around. And people were chatting and all sorts of things. So we didn't get as good at high quality radiation measurements, but we did uh, on the same instrument at the same time, with much the same equipment, the, um, <clears throat> the sound um, inside the instrument. And I will show it to you because it, it's not what I think people would actually have expected when one's measuring the sound inside. Whoops, why won't it go down? 
the the box where we see next. Oh, okay, no, I've got to get rid of that. I'm going to do this. Yes. Right. So this this is the the sound, the comparison of the radiated sound and the internal sound, um, measured in Jim's noisy garden. This is um, measurements here on, on my instrument. It's a VOM, and I'm uh, here. You can see B1 minus, B1 plus, and you can see a little bit of a CBR mode just down there if you're lucky, and you've got a split. Notice um, a naught. That, that, that splitting comes from uh, an interaction of one of the um, neck modes with, the, with, with uh, exciting the A0 mode. Um, but you can see the internal sound is not just a resonance at um, uh, 300 hertz, which is the A0 resonance. The next mode is miles up above uh, kilohertz, but what you're seeing is basically virtually the same thing. Lovely clean measurements, there's no, virtually no noise on it, and you're getting just the same information in a very clean way. Um, it's, it's actually, that's the internal sound, it so happens that it's um, proportional to the frequency squared um, because the um, internal, um, I, I wanted to compare the radiator sound with the internal sound. The internal sound pressure depends on how much one squeezing the sound in, in and out of the cavity. The radiated sound depends, in fact, on the acceleration. It's the thing that pushes waves away. It's no good just doing this because if, the air will come back with you and the air will just go backwards and forwards. You've got to push it like this. Um, and so it, the, the radiated sound is, is proportional to the air, in, air pressure inside times, in fact, the frequency squared. And that's the, what I've done is because obviously the radiation depends on distance. I've just made the two um, on for the plot. The A naught's the same sort of size, um, and you can see they have exactly the same features, including the little bumps here. Um, and um, the, these um, uh, are the um, internal sound, and you can see that they're, they're not quite the same but they're, they're comparable, and as far as a maker is concerned, what you want to know is what the frequencies of those two modes are going to be and what, are, what their relative heights are. Well, it, it, it's a, it gives you a guide to the relative heights uh, and positions of the frequencies. So this very simple measurement of measuring the sound at the acoustic center of the violin um, gives you immediately the sound uh, um, uh, of the, the main modes that you've got some control of, as a violin maker, that is the, the positions of these B1 minus and B1 plus modes, there's not much you can do about the A0 mode other than make it as strong as you can. Um, um, and that means um, the, the A0 mode, um, the strength of that is determined to a large extent by how close these two modes are in frequency. So if you lower the frequencies of these, this one would go up. If you bring those down, that the a, a naught would actually go up. So it, you're not just seeing a single resonance here, and this is what I want to emphasize. The single resonance that's involved is, is just the Helmholtz resonance here at 300 hertz. The next one is way, way about here, but you're getting all the information too, because they're normal modes which have got mixtures of the plate modes and the air modes, and you're seeing exactly the same sort of behavior that you get on the radiation. And that is the, to my mind, the main value, particularly to, uh, to instrument makers um, who want to keep an eye, uh, a measurement of what's actually happening acoustically. And you don't get this information, for example, from the admittance because for, for, the, the, uh, this really is proportional to the sound. Um, and the admittance, you don't get anything like this, a peak as strong as this, um, because um, in the mittens, you're measuring what the plates are doing rather than what the air is doing. So um, this, this is just a little bit of mathematics, as it were, um, that, that's, that said virtually what I've said before. Um, that, that, that's the signature modes where the radiated pressure is proportional to the internal pressure times the frequency squared. At higher frequencies, it, the um, sound, uh, the internal sound, um, pressures are proportional to the um, radiated sound. So 
um, but they're filtered by the overall response of the air inside. So something that's good at um, vibrating and making lots of radiated sound will also be good at making internal sound. And we'll see that later on. So, um, uh, and I've made these points before, but um, by doing measurements like this, it's very easy to do comparisons between um, different instruments because um, even in, di uh, in different concert spaces, because basically you've got uh, the standard volume and shape of the inside of the violin. So the response is independent of where you're actually playing the violin. So make, trying to make comparisons between violins is readily done and um, um, uh, with, 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 with some, some um, confidence in demands if you use um, measurements like this. Otherwise, you've got to use an anoic chamber. So this is my laboratory. I just wanted to compare it with Envy, uh, the uh, 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 laboratories we saw yesterday morning. Um, so my, 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 uh, um, my laboratory here is, is, is this area here. Um, in the corner of my, my study, um, has a computer, obviously, it's an old laptop computer I wouldn't, wasn't using. Um, it has a violin that we put on, um, I just put on this foam mount um, that allows the vibrate and the, the violin to vibrate easily. I'm going to tap it with a hammer in the usual way that you've seen people doing things. And there's a microphone that's been passed through the I hear, and in fact, the microphone is here, and I fixed a magnet to it. And the idea of fixing a little magnet to it is that you, then you can locate exactly where it is, because you put, put that in through the F-hole, um, and then you put another magnet on the other side, and it attracts it, and you can move it around about anywhere over the, the, the body of the, the back plate. So you can measure the sound pressure anywhere you like um, inside the instrument. Um, the um, mic little microphone here is here. It's one of these electric microphones. Um, and um, that's just on the end of a lead with another jack point at the end there, jack plug. I have a, a very simple um, pendulum type system where I can swing and allow this to hit and give a little tap, and that's got a microphone on the end. I'll tell you about the microphone on the end, which has been modified in, in, so that you seal off the microphone. It simply then acts as an accelerometer in a way I'll talk about in a minute. Um, these two jack plugs, plugs go into a very, very uh, simple, no, it's my, you're all in my way, a single, this is the dongle, right? The dongle is the thing that you add on to something to make it useful. Um, it's run by, uh, has a little battery, and it, it uh, whoops. And, uh, and here you have um, all that's required to make this little dongle, which makes all these experiments possible, um, it, it is just a couple of um, sockets to take the jack plugs from the microphone and the, mic uh, <coughs> and the hammer. And it has, just has as you might see, two resistances and two small capacitances. They have to be soldered together onto this, and that's all there is to it. So I'm not suggesting you necessarily would want to do it yourself. You might want to give it to a friend who's used to using a soldering iron. But it's very, very simple to make, and everything that I'm going to show you from now on is going to be made with a very simple system like this. Um, and yeah, so yes, and I, I use an inexpensive sound card, an external sound card, from Behringer's, the UCA 202, which costs about 30 ECU, I guess, something like that or order of magnitude. So the, the, the microphone and the hammer, um, well, we'll see to that, cost next to nothing. You can buy these microphones. Um, if you buy them at 50 at a time, you can buy 50 at a time for about $10. Um, so, um, and you can buy them in smaller numbers, five for about three. Um, and they come in various sizes. I tend to use a 10 millimeter one um, for the 
hammer head, as it were, the six millimeter one um, that, that goes into um, the lower eyes, the F hole is quite easy to put a violin. You can use bigger ones if you're using um, um, viola, cello, and double bass. Um, <coughs> but um, they, um, the, the larger they are, the larger the area of the diaphragm, and more sensitive they tend to be. So, um, just in case one of your friends wants to make it, I put a circuit diagram here, and that's very simple. This is the microphone. It has two terminals here. One of them is connected to the case. You just might just be able to see a little bar that goes across here. That one is the one that goes to the negative of a battery. And the other one um, is connected both to a resistor, and the resistor here is connected to the battery and provides a current that runs through. Um, and the other connection goes out to the probe because there's a DC, DC voltage across here and you're interested in the AC, that is the changing voltage that comes from the vibrations across. Now I don't use anything as big as this, I use one microfarad because I'm not so interested in measuring the very low frequencies, but that allows me to go up to 100 hertz, uh, above 100 hertz very easily. Um, I should add that the microphone here has, has its own electronic circuit inside it, which allows you to give an output here, not like a piezoelectric output, but you can feed it directly like this into a normal amplifier, the line inputs. So you don't have to worry about stray capacitances and things like that. They're impervious to um, um, interference from... Well. So this is what the, the microphones look like. And um, this is the top. And to turn it into a hammerhead, all one does is to take a blob of two-tube epoxy and just put it on the top here and heat it up just a little bit so it, it, it um, um, uh, flows a little bit. It'll flow to the outside edges and you'll end, end up with a, a shallow, generally, hemispherical bowl. And that then forms the actual hammer head. Now, as I say, each one of those costs much less than a cup of coffee. So you're not spending a thousand pounds for a microphone or for an expensive um, uh, um, hammer. Um, I mean, I, I'm nothing against people using the, the finest quality, but I'm, what I'm showing here, you can play around with this and if you want to and you can get used to it for virtually no, no cost. And then if you want to do something more sophisticated, you can. Um, I've got, um, uh, I decided I'd make rather, I don't like metal around violins. Um, and so I thought I'd make a, um, a, a wooden uh, system for um, using the hammer. The hammer I glue onto, um, uh, in fact, a cable tie and um, the cable tie is, is on a spindle here, and I use the spindle from some Lego, actually, a Lego wheel, and, and, and take the wheels off and turn that into a, a support for, for the, the pendulum. Um, this, this is just a piece of cantilevered wood to take it out above the, the violin when, when you push it out with this. Um, and I, it can slide up and down on, on a... a wooden um, rod, as it were, into a he relatively heavy base plate. And, um, and I use two O-rings that are re relatively tight fits onto the, the rod. And I glue those before I put them on the rod with some super glue, Gorilla super glue gel, and it, it binds well to the rubber and well to the wood. And you, you, so you, you get, get um, this um, system here, which is flexible, and you can push push this whole system um, up and down to, to meet the height of the, the actual um, <coughs> uh, instrument that you're going to knock here with the hammer um, uh, to get a, um, uh, the initial input. And that um, there's another alternative thing here where you can actually glue it onto the end um, and without um, the super glue and O-rings, you can use strong rubber bands to press the 
um, sliding um, beam up and down. In fact, I try to match the curvature, of course, of the beam to the inside curvature, the concave curvature of the piece of wood with a file. So, so it's a reasonably good fit to, as it slides up and down, so it doesn't twist sideways. So that, 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 that's the inexpensive hammer unit and, and mod, mod, modification. This is, this, um, uh, I seem to have lost a slide here. Um, but if we go back to here, the, these are the, this is the um, um, microphone and, and the magnet there, which allows me to wander around. This, this is the microphone with the seal top on the end of the um, pendulum. And these are the leads that go away. And those leads, of course, then go into the dongle here over here. Um, and the dongle has this, the two resistors and the capacitance, and they, they go then into the um, <coughs> sound card, which is a fixed gain sound card. So you don't have to worry that you've got the gain controls right. And that then goes into the computer. And of course, then you have to, the, the, the real cleverness comes in having um, some computer software, um, which allows you to um, take the signals from the, the hammer. And this is, this is the output from the hammer, um, the, the microphone on the head of the hammer. You can see it's flat for a, a large region, then falls off at high frequencies. And in fact, when you use it as a microphone, it, the response goes all the way up to about 10 um, kilohertz and, and beyond. So, and this is the actual shape of the actual hammer as it hits the bridge and then comes and bounces back off of the bridge. And um, that all happens. The whole of that is 100 microseconds. That's about 50 microseconds long. It's not in contact with the bridge for very long. So that's, uh, while it's doing that, is it's exerting this influence on the bridge, um, the input onto the bridge, which excites the air inside. And this is on a completely different scale. This is on a thousand times larger scale. This is now in milliseconds, and this is the signal that, that that little pulse gives as it excites all the modes of the instrument. And then what you see in the, um, inside is what I was showing you before, just in this limited range here. But here, don't worry about the blue line for the moment. Um, this is the response of the, uh, of the particular violin, um, and it's exciting the A0 resonance. In this particular case, with this particular violin, the, this little resonance down here is the neck resonance, um, which now, instead of being on top of that, is, is a little bit below. Um, some makers, I, I as I understand it, like to make put those together because they think it might help. I don't think it does very much difference to the acoustics uh, of the sound, but um, if they find it's helpful, that, that's fine. Um, uh, um, um, th this tiny little bump here is the CBR, resonance. This one here is the B1 minus, and this one is the B1 plus, and this one here is the A1, because I haven't got it quite at the, the point where the, um, why is that gone? Seems to have gone a bit duller. Has it on yours? Perhaps with my sight. Uh, um, uh, um, uh, you know what that is, that's a bit from the A1 resonance, that's the B1 resonance. Notice the very big dip that you get always for the violin in this range about between 700 and 800 hertz. And then you get the transition modes, you can see, just as you would in the radiation measurements, but you're not having to do any, uh, remember the radiation measurements are highly directional by you get time here. You get a one, uh, a one single curve that's, that's telling you something about those transition element, um, modes. And then you get this general peak over here, which is the Bridge Hill region here. Again, you don't have to do anything in terms of averaging, for example, the radiation. Um, and th this is, in fact, the, the, the front page, as it were, of um, George's software. Now, George's software is, it represents some ten, probably tens of thousands of hours uh, of, of, of developing it over the years to be the incredibly useful 
and versatile um, system that it is. It allows one to do all sorts of things as a researcher that you wouldn't want to do as a, a maker. But as a maker, you're, you're getting exactly the information that you need out here straight away. And you've got a cursor that can come up here and you can go eat over each of these um, individual peaks and, uh, and record not only the, the frequency, but the height of these peaks, all of which are, of course, important and will vary from one instrument to the other. And if you're trying to match, for example, the Titian Strad, which is the sort of thing that, that um, um, uh, Joe Curtin and um, uh, George Stepani do, and not necessarily the Titian Strad, but you know, Strads with properties uh, or instruments rather with properties that you really try to develop with special qualities. This is the way to have the one to record instruments on a regular basis so you know what your instrument actually did and you can compare it with new instruments that you're making and you can have a standard instrument that you can keep going back to and making measurements on to make sure it's not changes in your measurement system. So uh, um, uh, it's a, an excellent one of a way of characterizing the acoustics of any instrument that any maker makes. And I, I, well, I'll provide somewhere, probably through um, Claudia, a link to Jeff Robinson's Overland Notes, um, which are, were developed for the Overland workshops when we were running, or well, I wasn't, Jeff was running courses on the use of this, but the, the use of that was to do modal analysis, which is far, far more complicated. It's, um, and, um, you, I mean, th these measurements take less than five minutes to make. You just go across with your violin, put it there, put your microphone inside and tap it, and you've got your results immediately. Um, so you can do lots of measurements, as I'll show you in a minute, um, um, in a very short time. Um, uh, uh, but it also allows you um, with, with um, but if you're doing modal analysis, you've got to do something like a hundred of these types of measurements to find out how the plate is actually vibrating at all its modal frequencies. And that's a really big job. And um, uh, but, uh, that's what his acquisition is extremely valuable for when people want to really understand the modes themselves rather than understand what they're doing in terms of the acoustic peaks. And as I say, it is particularly in this region um, uh, down here where, the, where you've got some control as a maker over the actual frequencies and heights of, of those modes. Um, and particularly in this region up here, which is the Bridge Hill region, where changes in what's happening in the island area and the position of the sound post and the balance between the sound post and the bass bar, in my view, um, is all important. Um, and again, these are the, the sort of area that you've got some control of. I uh, hear low frequencies in the signature modes that gives the warmth to the sound of the violin. Here you've got the, the modes that are giving the signals here, that are giving the brightness um, uh, uh, um, and um, to some extent the intensity of the sound of the instrument. I will, there's also Chris Rogers has, has developed some software, um, which um, is a simplified version. It's based on George's software. Um, uh, and um, uh, it, it's um, developed for, for the opening workshop. And, and Joseph Curtin in particular um, was wanting a, a, a nice simple cut down version. And um, but it doesn't have the versatility, which I find very extremely valuable, um, uh, of George's software. Though it could, um, but these are don't cost ten. The software does not cost ten thousand uh, pounds a piece, which commercial software would, um, because it's been developed by you know, over a long period. But I mean, if you talk to people nicely. And if you're good, you will give them a little bit of a donation um, because they're to represent the enormous hard work that, that both of them have been doing, um, but particularly George over many years. And uh, he's not paid for any of this. So um, this is some, um, I've, got an, I've got an earlier version. Um, uh, this, this is um, 
uh, <clears throat> some early measurements um, of, of um, my, my V and violin, um, showing you what, uh, what I've showed before, but it's also showing what's happening here in the transition region. Um, this is the um, uh, Cox, uh, at Oberlin, a Cox viola, somewhat similar. Um, you can see it's also violas have got the same um, A naught, um, B1 um, minus breathing mode, and you're, uh, that's what's happening. Someone should have told me. Um, I hope this doesn't um, ruin what I've got here. Okay, so it's okay, well, it's still all right. Um, it's brought up another computer, I'm afraid. And, um, uh, and then there's lots of other, uh, on, on the viola here, some really rather prominent, uh, prominent resonances. These are not air resonances, incidentally. These are resonances of the actual body of the instrument. I don't know what they are, and you would have to do modal analysis to find out. Um, the, the very earliest measurements that we made, um, I reported at a, uh, um, at a, um, um, a SMAC um, European conference way back in 2013, surprisingly how long I've been doing this sort of thing. Um, and this is measurements that you would find it very hard to make indeed, because these are measurements on, uh, in normal terms, these are measurements on bases, double bases. There are virtually no measurements, acoustic measurements on double bases, for the reasons I've told you. I mean, they're very large and the acoustic wavelengths are very long and you have to use, a, um, you know, even the anionic chambers aren't very good at these low frequencies, but it's easy to do um, measurements inside a double base. These measurements were made on uh, uh, one evening um, when um, light clouds have an ill, a silver lining, this was a, a, a sad lining, uh, as it so happens, but it meant that a large number of double bases in various states of repair were in a single room. And there were a very enthusiastic group of double base makers, youngsters, who came along with me and we just did these measurements. Um, and it just shows you how, um, what information you can get out about some of these larger instruments and the cello as well, in a very reliable way. Again, there's very little noise. The, 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 these are three measurements on um, one of Macintosh's double bases, which are believed to be some of the best by the Americans at any rate. And you can see now, now we've got um, a, a resonance at, at just above 55 kilohertz um, of the empty shell, no sound post. Here you can see, see exactly the same effect that you would actually get with a violin. You can see when you put the sound post in, you're seeing the A0 resonance um, increase and, the, um, uh, uh, and this mode too, this breathing mode increase as well. Um, uh, then when you put the strings on, you get all these string modes which are superimposed um, with, with, on, on top of these measurements with, um, here, these are measurements were made with damp strings. This is with undamped strings. And you can see the importance of the damp strings in the actual resonant properties of the double bass. And the, all these resonances here, they're very sharp resonances. And the sharper the resonances, the longer they go on ringing. So if you're interested in actually the ringing sound of, of a double bass, it's um, the ringing by the, the sound of the rubber bass comes from all these sharp resonances that are coming in and superimposed on, on, on the, the, the admittance curve, not the admittance curve, this is internal um, sound um, measurements um, uh, with, um, with, with the strings down. And this is why I say, and I still believe strongly that if you're trying to look at um, uh, the sound of an instrument, whether it's a violin or, or dollar bass. Um, in a certain sense, it's important to have the strings undamped because it is actually telling you immediately what the sound is actually going to sound like in, in, the, in the radiated sound as well. 
So that, that's, that's one thing. Um, the, the next one is actually comparing um, different double bases. Um, this, this is the, um, the, these three double bases are uh, very different um, in their construction. Um, this one is an old European flatback. That's one that's much more like a vial. And instead of just a single resonance like this, what you've actually got in the superimposed, this, this resonance here, which is the, basically the F-hole resonance at that frequency, you've got, instead of the on one resonance here, you've got three resonances across here. And that comes, I think, from the different sections of the flat, flat regions of the little double brace. So you've got the front plate, you've got the top shoulder um, sloping part, and you've got the main body part. And that's giving you three resonances rather than one resonance. It's very different. This is the Macintosh double bass again um, with um, its uh, damp strings. And this uh, instrument here is made from a laminate type construction. And you can see it's very similar to the, um, the frequencies aren't quite the same. Um, um, uh, but but what, what you can, it basically has the same characteristics. And the double bass um, and the cello to some extent tends to have very strong A naught and a breathing mode. And it's the breathing mode that excites the A naught resonance. Um, and so it's the plate vibrations of that mode there that excite the A naught resonance to give this strong peak here, has a high Q um, when you measure it inside, but if you measure the admittance, it's just only a tiny peak. But when you measure the sound, you get a big peak like this, radiated and internal. And then the sound falls off very quickly. I should say that these gradations correspond to 6 dB. That is a change in um, amplitude of the signal um, uh, by about a half. So each one corresponds to a half change. So that, that, that going from that's a half, a quarter, an eighth, a sixteenth, a thirty second, etc. Okay. If I may. You just said that the Macintosh with undamped strings. No, because it's an empty shell. Yeah, no, uh, well, sorry, I, I, I think. This is an empty shell, no sound post. Mm, uh, no um, you have the to compare. Yeah, this is empty shell. Yeah. Uh, sorry, that's yeah. empty shell. You're, you're quite right. You're very noticeable. Yes. OK, thank you. I've got to get rid of my thing coming up. OK, and, and these are the same instruments again with the extra um, uh, strings on, uh, on them. Not all the instruments, I couldn't test all the instruments because lots of them were in states of, of, of great disrepair. Okay, so um, one of the things I was obviously interested in is my own instruments. I mean, I, I, uh, or rather my wife's. My wife has a nice Italian instrument by Michel Decane. Um, I have a very nice instrument from um, draw Stepani, based on the Titian Strad, and I have a Vion. It's a St. Seal um, Vion. It's unfortunately not an un un signed one, so it's not quite so valuable, but it's a very good instrument all the same. And I, I was very interested to, to try to understand why they sounded so different under my ear. Now, um, uh, one of the ways to do that, of course, is to measure um, the, um, the, the internal sound and look for differences. Now, there are some certain differences, um, but they're, I mean, the peaks are just like the strabs, they, they, they vary around a little bit um, from here, but you've, you've got um, in the um, decane violin, for example, the B1 minus and B1 plus and they're closer together, whereas in my, my blue one, they're further apart. And in fact, in some senses, the Titians are almost further apart. Um, not much difference in this range here. There's a little bit here. Um, there's quite big changes here. The decane is rather weak in, in this region here, and I can't show the, the, that that's around about 2,000 hertz. Um, uh, but the decane, by comparison, what, what, what tends to happen is you lose peaks down here, they come up up here. And so there's a sort of balance. So it does rather well out here, whereas my VO doesn't do so well either as well in this region here uh, as the nutrition. And it's quite clear what uh, uh, there's a difference in sound, a very noticeable difference in sound. 
Um, George's violin, for example, is much more brilliant than mine. And it's not surprising when you look at this. These are 2 dB sets, I think. Um, uh, and it shows up very easily. So if you want to do comparisons between instruments um, in a nice and quick, easy way, um, again, the, inter the internal sound measurements are valuable not only in the um, low frequency signature mode region, but I, I believe over the whole range of the instrument, it's a very, very valuable tool. Another thing that we actually did was to, um, uh, at an Oberlin workshop, um, we had finished for the violin makers workshop, but the double bass players were, were going, the, the double bass makers rather, uh, it was a longer workshop and was carrying carry on doing, uh, sorry, the, the, viola, the, the, viola, uh, the viola workshop. It's the violin makers were do, making violas. All of them were making a different viola, but all of them made to a viola with the same outline. But they were free to do anything they liked in terms of arching, choice of materials, um, <coughs> uh, come what may. Everything you can do as a, a, as a maker. And what we've got here, again, it was just done in an evening session. It can't have been more than three hours. Um, and we looked at all 25 violas and measured the internal sound and superimposed all the results on top of each other. And uh, this was interesting for me because I, I didn't have a general idea of knowing to what extent violas look like violins. But it shows you that, that violas look very much like violins. They have a well-defined A0. Um, and, uh, they have a CBR mode, they have a B1 minus and a B1, um, B1 plus mode, then a big dip, at a somewhat lower frequency than the, the violin, then they have a transition mode, and then they have a, a bridge hill. Interestingly, with, with uh, these higher frequencies, you actually see some peaks on top, and those are the peaks that are actually coming through from the um, cavity modes. Remember, we're making these measurements inside. So you're not down in this region down here, you're not seeing much evidence of, of very strong resonances from the cavity modes because they are so strongly coupled themselves to a number of modes all around it from the, sh the shell. Um, and so they get broadened out. So they just become one of the normal modes, not necessarily indistinct, not, no, not more distinguishable really, um, for example, a tailpiece resonance or something like that, within the whole of this transition area. But they do seem on the viola to start standing out. Now, I haven't seen this um, on violins, um, which would suggest, in fact, of course, as you go to higher frequencies, that violins perhaps are more strongly coupled um, to the plates in general than, than, than violas are. And that's an interesting um, point. Um, so we can start to learn some really quite important information. The other thing one can do is George's uh, um, software allows me to do an average of all those, and I can take any one of those and look at it as opposed to the average. You can't say which is best. So Claudia will have to tell me which one is the best instrument, but I took out one that seemed to have the typical results um, um, and tried it against the average, and it fits pretty well. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just going to finish with one, um, one um, fa fascinating um, uh, thing that happens. And, and uh, I have some evidence for why it happens, and I believe for the first time properly. Um, we, we were doing experiments um, in the violin workshop with cellos. And one of the things we were doing was show, trying to see what actually happens with, with the acoustic properties of the cello when it was an end pin and just a normal end pin was put on an ordinary wooden uh, surface. If it's supported by bungee cords, you just take a table, turn it upside down and put, um, instead of elastic bands, you put bun bungee cords onto and support the thing and measure, again, it's, it's internal um, sound. Notice that there's very little difference here um, in the A-noughts that one measures, um, uh, or even the, this mode here. But on a bungee cord, I suspect you're getting a bungee cord resonance there. I can't be sure about that. Um, 
But the, the, the really exciting thing is that at, at a previous Oberlin meeting, we had had demonstrated um, a cello, but when you um, had a, a, a really bad wolf note, and that when you put it on a block of, not, of travertine, which is a, a, a rock type sample, particularly chemical composition, it, um, it removed the, the wolf note completely, completely. And I mean, you had to hear it to believe it. And um, everyone puzzled about this. Everyone agreed it couldn't be a special property of travertine and, uh, and something, but there was something about the travertine block and the way it was mounted that, that was actually killing the wolf note. And of course, if you've got a nice method of killing the wolf note, um, that would be extremely valuable to cellists, particularly if it only happens at one frequency. And here we have an example of some measurements on one cello when it worked. It doesn't work on every cello, um, and you would have to, to tune things to get things right, I think. And different cellos have different properties. And I'll tell you what I believe is causing this. But when you put it on the travertine block, blow me, if this resonance here didn't change, notice this. So it's nothing to do with instrumentation. This drop down here, right down to this low value down here. And, and that, that's, this, this is in, um, that, that, that's something like a 6 dB or more change. Um, it's more than that. And that's the sort of change that you need to do to get rid of wolf notes. And so um, uh, I, I, more recently we did some more measurements and we showed that it, although that actually occurred in uh, one of the instruments we tested, it didn't occur in all of them. Some of them seem to be completely un, unfazed by it. And I believe what is actually happening is that when, when one um, puts the end pin really on a really rigid surface, um, and that the, tail, the um, end pin is really a rigid object, and we've done experiments to show you can change the length of the, um, the, the tail piece uh, on, on a cello. We did this with Tom King, I think. Um, you can change it over all its lengths, and it didn't make any difference to the, the acoustic properties. Um, so the tail piece, to my mind, uh, has much of a, a, a lesser effect than some people believe. Um, but, but again, this can be easily tested in this sort of way. And um, uh, it, it, this I believe because I've then done a co computer computation of putting an end pin on a violin. And if you put an end pin on the violin and rest it on a surface, what happens is that the, the, the instrument um, bounces up on, uh, on the end of the end pin that's attached to the um, um, uh, instrument itself. So what you're getting is a, uh, is a deflection of the bottom part of the, um, <clears throat> uh, the, the shell of the instrument as the mass of the instrument bounces up and down on, on it. And that gives rise to a, different, a, a new mode. And that mode, if it's tuned right, and that will depend on exactly how the end pin is fitted to the lower half of the, of, uh, of the instrument itself and the bendability and flexibility. If it happens to coincide um, um, with the, the wolf note frequency, it can kill it. And it, it's an interesting idea and one would like to be able to develop uh, an end pin connection that would automatically get rid of wolf notes. So I'm, I think I, I, I've finished up all my slides. Um, and I haven't got the ending that, that I'm supposed to obviously pull up um, the wrong one, or this has pulled up the wrong one. And um, I just wanted to thank everyone and hope you find it interesting. And, and, and it'd be great if, uh, if uh, uh, more uh, makers, a number of them already do, use a simple system like this to um, look, look at the acoustic properties of, of their instruments during the making. Thanks very much indeed. I finished, Claudia. Okay, thank you. I just had to unmute my, my microphone. Um, okay, so time for, for questions. Uh, I think Martin Schleske has, uh, has a question. Yeah, Martin.
Martin? I can't see Martin. He was here before. He asked quite a few questions on the chat, and I told him that he should ask you orally um, at the end. And now oh. he's gone. He's gone. Okay. Let me check. No, he's there. I mean, he's still connected, but. Uh, Martin, can, can you unmute un yourself? He doesn't have a microphone. Not a microphone. Moment. Okay. Uh -huh. so Martin, okay, fine. Sorry. Martin, okay. Martin, do you want what, me to read yes, the chat read, for you? Yes, read it. Read it. Uh, so let me find it. Uh, let me find it because it's um, it's quite up. Uh, where is it? Um, okay, looking at the average response, I fear that measuring inside the cavity creates quite misleading results. A0 mode in reality of radiation uh, has, uh, never has that high level compared with B1 minus and B1 plus. The ratio between the mode is far more important than the exact frequency. Well, I, 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 I said this is not exact, but, but, um, uh, but um, it will be the same for all violins. And if, if I went back to the slide, it showed the comparison between the radiated sound and the um, um, uh, internal one, the very first slide I showed, you, you saw that there was a great similarity between the two. And um, I, I'm, I'm not suggesting for one moment that, that, that you should read off exactly what the pressure, uh, sound pressures are. I'm saying that they're very closely similar and, um, uh, and um, the, the measurements actually agree extremely well. And it's not just with that one instrument. Um, with what you actually see the radiator sound, but we have far fewer measurements, in fact, to, to actually compare the two. And it's a major piece of work that needs to be done. And I would agree, agree with Martin with that. Work, uh, for, for a maker, um, what you want to know is um, um, what your frequencies are uh, and your red, red, and change differences between one instrument and another. Uh, of, of the relative heights and spacing. That's my best defense I can give at the moment. Martin, do you want to say something? Okay, he said the similarity is not enough. The exact ratio between levels is important for comparing instruments. Well, you could do that. But if, you have a, if you have two instruments and you compare them, you can see the, 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 what I'm saying is the relative changes in the two, you, you, you can have some reliance on because you're make, measuring it exactly in exactly the same acoustic. That is the internal acoustic of, of the instrument. I'll, I, I'll, I'll, I, may I come back to Martin on that separately? Because otherwise we'll get bogged down on that. Yeah. Okay, I think Andreas wanted to raise a question. Andreas, you have to mute yourself. Yes. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, what is, uh, as far I, as I understand it, uh, the internal microphone measurements are quite reliable um, at, at the signature modes. And um, they, they really uh, represent really well uh, what's happening below 1,000 uh, 1, hertz or whatever, or below 800. So yeah. uh, if, uh, if we want, want to do kind of set up uh, modifications or whatever, uh, that are normally very small changes and yeah. uh, which uh, mainly uh, occur in the high frequency region. Yeah. So, um, Am I right? I um, that internal microphone measurements won't yeah. help me with that. Yes, they will. They, they will absolutely. And you see, you immediately say interesting thing. There's there's some of microphones getting in. You you immediately see interesting things. I've got I've got slides that I could show you, but I'm obviously limited. 
I've done measurements with mutes of different, uh, of different sizes, for example. You put a mute on, and um, that's where you're particularly interested in what's happening in that region. And um, you see um, um, amazing sorts of changes. Um, yes, the mute does actually drop down um, things in, in the um, uh, Bridge Hill area, as you might expect, but it does all sorts of things in different regions. Some regions will actually go up while others go down. It's nothing like as simple uh, as uh, the textbooks actually suggest. Now, normally, normally you just think it's the extra mass that's putting things down and therefore it's lowering the frequency of all the modes. But that isn't, it has an effect down, even down to a kilohertz, and it happens in different ways from those of the necessarily of the, um, uh, 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 the higher frequencies. So you can get a lot more detailed information. And the point is, if you've got a single instrument, the one thing that you can really do with great confidence is if you make a change, you see that change at those frequencies that you're interested in uh, on the internal field, just in the same way that one would in the acoustic field. Okay. So you, you can actually rely on that. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. It's great, see your workshop. And I, your call. <laughs> I just wanted to ask a question. Yep. Yes, hi Colin, um, and thanks for your talk. I, unfortunately, I missed the very first part of it, but probably I can get that later on. But I have a question about the magnet and the microphone. Um, yep. Is it, I presume it's an omni microphone. Uh, it's an omni, omni yes, omni I, I should have said omni, yeah. Right, exactly. so, uh, but, uh, and it's an electric mi microphone, so does the magnet have any influence on it or doesn't it matter because you're just- Well, I, I, if it had any, any influence, it had, I, I, I think not, in fact. I think because you use it as a microphone, and if you use it as a microphone, it still has a very flat response out to a very high frequency. Yeah. I was thinking because you could. It is, it is slightly magnetic, I, I must say, right. but it's only very, very slightly magnetic. Okay. Somewhere. Uh, I suppose yeah. you could put the microphone on like a drinking straw type of thing to yes. bring it closer to the center of the instrument. Uh, yes, that, that, that's not important. I talked about that earlier on because oh, okay. it's the, 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 mode, the modes, at certainly at low frequencies, up to about three kilohertz are two-dimensional in character, and they have uh -huh. no variation um, right. um, uh, uh, between the top and back, back face. Right. Okay. And then I have another question about the jumping mode of the cellos and basses. Yeah. In relation to the end pin. Um, where would you say that um, uh, the measurement point of uh, to, to actually measure that jumping resonance would be? Well, uh, uh, there's a simple measurement one could do. One could, uh, if, if by what I'm suggesting is right, it, uh, and it's the center of mass of the whole cello going up and down on the bendability of the bottom part of it, then very simple measurement of an acceleration accelerometer on, on the neck would do, just the neck joint. On the top. On the, the vertical top. direction yeah. ought to show that. Right. But, I mean, there is a, there is, without doubt, there is a mode there um, um, because I can compute it and show that there can be, but it, that relies on the end pin being absolutely rigidly um, um, stuck to the bottom of the instrument with no floppiness or anything like that, or, or no, uh, um, and that, um, that, that the shell itself is deformable. Well, right. take a balloon, imagine putting a balloon on, on, on a, a, a sound post, and you, you know there'd be a mode that, that would it would bounce up and down like that. Yeah. And, it, and it's the same sort of mode as that. Right. Yeah, George and I, George Stepani and I did a modal analysis of a base and we were going to do this measurement, but never got around to it. Well, George, George said, George, George told me to do it too. Where is George oh. there? <laughs> I don't know. George has heard me talk about this so many times. He's, uh, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> and I don't remember measuring the base with you. <laughs> yeah, in your, in your old workshop, yeah. I remember we did a model analysis of that Amati copy base. And we put. No, you did that somewhere else. You did no, that. In your old workshop. Not, not in my workshop. We're all. I, I, I can speak for some, some of the odors. Our memories are not as good as it used to be. <laughs> I'll send you pictures, George. <laughs> Yeah, I have the data, but uh, <laughs> well, if you actually, uh, work places, we really need 
music to do with war because they're they're re really interesting. I mean, because you know, basses without low frequency output are no use for anything, uh, and so they, they've got to function really well at that, and that makes them you know very interesting topic. Yeah, uh, a lot of opportunities for actually to make it happen through understanding the the, the workings of the system. Okay, thanks, Colin. Uh, other people. Okay. Can I, can I make another point, which is uh, th there was somebody asking about, you know, the differences at higher frequencies and things in, in setup work. I personally don't think uh, modal analysis or uh, any of these acoustic measurement systems are all that useful for that. You know, when it comes to assessing an instrument's sound and um, playing qualities, uh, you can't be playing it and listening to it. So in, in fact, I mean, I would always adjust a sound post or something according to you know, my own response to it or that of a, a client or somebody else playing it. And I, I sure I look at measurements, but I, I don't think they would really be my, they wouldn't guide me all that well, because we're mostly looking at changes that are within the um, range of error for a measurement. So if you, if you do um, a structural radiation measurement and you break it all down, put the bits away, get them out and again, set it all up, do the measurement again, you're going to have 2 dB differences in various places in the spectrum. And, the, and if that's the order of difference you're getting in, in the adjustments, I don't really think no. that measurement method is the tool for that job. But, it, but if you put a mute but on... But it does tell you a lot of global information. Sorry? Yeah, if you put a if you put a mute on, uh, um, and you, uh, you you can actually see way beyond the uh, experimental error. And I, I would say two dB is is uh, is the yes, limit. But the, what I do a, is a I, mute is a heavy. What I do is I take a, I take a break from measurements every now and again and just forget the whole thing, and just throw my wood on the floor and 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 stuff like that. Because uh, if you get too involved with the science, then you kind of, you have to keep that, you know, the balance between Apollo and Dionysus somehow going. That, that, oh, that, that's very posh. <laughs> well, that, that's why I think the, the internal sound measurements are just a, a quick and easy thing to do without thinking about the yeah. science at all. It gives you some evidence about what, 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 where, where your, your principal modes are. Uh, and, and you can relate that to, uh, to other instruments. As I said, you can have a standard instrument and find out, uh, using the same system, um, what the differences are between those two instruments. And you can do that within 2 dB. And you, uh, it, it was very uh, easy to see, for example, in, in the 25 violas, um, uh, uh, we have an average. And we, and we can look at every single one of those instruments against the average, and there are differences. And people are trying to correlate those differences with, with, with the sounds. And that's, that's the difficult part. But I mean, what, what, if you're aiming at trying, if you're aiming, I'm not suggesting you should aim, but if you were aiming to make a tonal quality uh, uh, something, you'd want to at least get your frequencies right. Uh, and, um, uh, and the relative, the relative sizes, uh, uh, for example, of the, the B1 minus B1 plus relative to the A0, something like that, something crude. Colin, could you, could you, uh, do you have an explanation for the really higher level of the A0 uh, in, in those internal plots? Um, and could you possibly but, calibrate or compensate for that? Yeah, yes, I have. And, and I, I, I said, in, uh, uh, as I started, Right, right from the beginning, you have to, the plots that I showed later on were the, the internal pressure measurements. What you have to do is to multiply that by F squared. And that might be coming back to where Martin uh, might have missed something earlier on. I don't know. But F squared is quite a lot, you see, because if you go from 300 hertz up, up to 600 hertz, that, that, that's, that, that's a matter of four in amplitude. That's 12 dB or something like that, you see. Um, so, um, um, uh, I mean, one, if one wants to, scientifically, if one was presenting the data and you wanted to make it a, 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 in the low frequency signature mode region, you have to, in fact, make that F squared, which is...
big direction. And that right. is why Martin is worried that, that, that the, um, the A0 resonance is so much larger than, than, than the other ones. It, it, I, that's absolutely predicted. Okay, thanks. Colin. Okay, there are, there are a few questions. Martino has raised his hands quite a while ago. So, Martino. Could Okay, thank you, and thank you, Colin, for your very interesting talk. So my question is uh, a bit about the physics of this measurement. You said that uh, at the beginning that the um, cavity modes couple with the, with the body modes, and this is why the internal measurement um, is very similar to the radiation of the instrument, right? Yeah. And my question is, um, could, could we use this, this type of measurement with an internal microphone for instruments that are not of the violin family? I'm more interested yes, in guitars, guitars, banjos. And the next thing I want to do, having heard Jim's talk, is to do some measurements of the internal um, sound inside the banjo mm -hmm. uh, okay. tomorrow. But um, uh, I haven't had much time <laughs> in the last few days. Oh, okay. So basically, we, we can use it for whatever instrument we want. Oh, it, it, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. My question is because you said that violins are quite shallow instruments, while guitars or mandolins are aren't. Um, well, I think I think yes. No, the the no, the guitar and mandolin, uh, mandolin less so. Perhaps I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the relative things. But the point is, uh, it it'll be two dimensional until the time that you can squeeze in a half a wavelength of sound between the top and back plates. Mm. You can work it out if you know what that dimension is. You, uh, that. But there's no, there's no trouble about that. Um, uh, it, it just means you get extra modes coming in from, from the air resonances. Mm. Okay. Uh, modes that still have the same, very, that all, the, all the things that actually happened with a, with the no wavelengths across the same thing the whole lot of modes with one way half wavelength across and the whole gamut of other modes um, along the um, the length and the width of the instrument that's a standard okay. physics in fact yeah okay thank you very much mm. uh, Carl, uh, um, thank, thank you um, as uh, me thinking as always. Um, the uh, magnetic mounting of the internal microphone would appear to be relatively rigid and I'm wondering yeah. if that means that the microphone is affected by body residences. Yeah, that, that is a, that's a very good point. In fact, I mean, um, it, it's typically about 30 dB down below. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not, not zero, but mm -hmm. it's pretty negligible. And fact, what I do nowadays is in fact glue, glue the microphone on uh, at right angles to the, uh, you have the magnet sitting like this and you put the magnet north, south, up and down like that. Um, uh, but when, when it's like this, the, 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 the diaphragm of the, the, of, the map of the microphone is perpendicular to the vibrations and therefore uh, you're not going to get, uh, that, that reduces it still further. The other, the other things that I sort of tried was putting it on flexible mountings and things like that. Um, sort of on the top of a spring, you know, like a mechanical engineer would do. Because, I mean, that, that starts to become fiddly. I wanted something that, that was nice and simple to use. And I'm only thinking of this as a simple workshop tool. Although I'm doing research with it, because it's capable of doing research, while I'm thinking of it, it's very much as something that anyone can set up in the lab in their workshop, in a corner of the workshop, permanently there, and just test to see what's happening. And if, if they are making small measurements at high, high, uh, high frequencies, changing a bridge or something like that, you can, you're looking at the single instrument, um, measuring in the same acoustic, you can tell what the difference is. If I change, for example, the rocking frequency of the bridge, which lots of people do, and, think, and, and say that's important, um, then, then I can see very easily on a single instrument um, what is actually happening. Uh, and it gives you a record of it, and that's the other thing. Um, whereas, you know, if, if you, you, you can point your phone these days at a, a, a thing and get frequencies out, but it's not necessarily recording it and putting it down on a piece of paper that you can put in your workshop notebook, 
So you can compare that instrument as it changes and with other instruments you made before and afterwards. And that seems that's, if I, if I was a, a real violin maker rather than a virtual violin maker, um, uh, that's what I'd want to do. I, I was a, I, I had a, a, a student um, using his uh, iPhone as an impact hammer. Um, <laughs> I think that would remain in contact for a long time. <laughs> well, not, not on a musical instrument, on, on something else, but it was very effective. Oh. Oh, yeah. and, yeah. and part of the idea there was to get across to him was, was re really we're looking, at, looking for a snapshot and sort of a, a quick insight into the dynamic of a system as opposed to rigorous, rigorous data. Um, and that was but, part of it. Yeah, well, I mean, I, yeah. Well, the, the impulse, which is a transient thing, it, it is rigorous. It can be rigorous, as you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're exciting but this, this, all frequencies. At, the great thing about impulses is you're exciting all frequencies at the same time, which interfere with each other because they've got different frequencies. So everything interferes, except at that one moment in time when they're all in phase with each other and they give you a, what's called a delta function. They all add up together once, and that's it forever. Thank you. All quiet on the Western Front? There is yes. a comment about... Yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> it's just like um, emergencies with the kids. Ah, <laughs> you think everything is organized and everything and you still get phone calls like, eh, appointment cancelled and everything. So We've still got 100 people, 100 people still on... Uh, yes, yeah. Um, so um, I don't see any raised hands. Maybe there we can look at the chat. I've heard the comment. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it's something you have to say every time you talk about making measurements on musical instruments, acoustic measurements. It's actually very much easier to teach people to take to do measurements, even to do complete modal analysis and, and the 24 point sound radiation and things. But the in order to make any sense of what that information means to be able to use it, I think that's when some kind of background in understanding the overall function of the musical instruments starts to come into play. So, for example, understanding on um, instruments with violin family with two arched plates, how those two top and back plates couple together to form uh, um, an independent breathing mode, how that couples with the air to perform, form your A0 and your B1 minus, and how the, you know, all these other things work. It's not, it's without that kind of framework of um, understanding the function, then you can't really make use of that uh, measurement information. Well, I, I, don't, I, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. When, when you look at a painting, <laughs> when, when you look at a painting, you can actually, um, I, I, I agree you can't get the subtleties out, but you don't have to understand, or, or, or driving a motor car, you don't have to know. Um, what a motor car does, but you do have to have a speedometer on it to know how fast you're going. Uh, and mm. it, there are the messages that come back to you with the sound of the, the instrument. So, uh, I, of course, I, of course, I always agree. Part. I always agree with you, George, because your points are always good. But I, but I, th I think if you, if you're making an instrument, if you've got you, you, you a, a few numbers that you can set down. All right, yeah. um, uh, about an instrument, then then it's useful in, in terms of classifying that instrument. Oh, absolutely. So you you can keep records of what you've done. So you've exactly. got information on. And that, that, that's that's what I, I that's so what I can. I, I won't do that thing. again. Uh, but I, say to, to what is it that I need to do to bring to, uh, the next time or to change that, this? That, that that's a, that's a completely different question. That. Yeah. Un un understanding how something works rather than actually recording what it does uh, are two completely different things. And I think for, for a maker, I don't believe makers have to understand. I mean, it's nice if they do, particularly if they're being guided by the science, if that ever happens, um, um, uh, into what they're actually doing. Um, uh, well, um, I disagree with you on that. So I think without the kind of framework of understanding the function of the instrument, 
this measurement process, it sort of just peters out into nothing after a bit. People get bored with it because it's not really helping very much. It's helping a bit, but not all well, that much. Uh, uh, in, in, in that case, you would never have any more acoustics workshops. No, but we do because because bit by bit uh, make us understand uh, the, uh, the the information yeah. that they're being given about the function of the instruments, and that's in well, a way that's the thing that's driving it. Could, could, I mean, I, I know it's research in a certain sense, but uh, supposing someone comes up with, with an idea that um, a, a completely different class of um, bridge. Or, or, as I suggested, some sort of unit you put your tailpiece on, and it completely gets rid of your um, uh, uh, wolf notes. Um, you, uh, I agree you need to know why, but as, as, as once that's known, um, people can then use it. Uh, they don't have to understand yeah, how it works. Uh, and, the, and, the, and we're talking about tools that are going to be useful for violin makers, and, and I see this as a potential tool that might be valuable to, to violin makers. Uh, I, <laughs> everyone well, will probably uh, agree with me. a meandering argument. I, I'm just saying that, like, you know, anything, if, you, if you're looking at, um, you know, you show the spectrum of your of the ohm versus, versus my petition, yeah. So, you know, some of those big things, yes, you know, you can say, well, actually, you know, it sounds brighter because it's got more high frequency radiation. So that, that's a, a fairly clear cut. Uh, and therefore, and if you say, therefore, well, why if I, would if, that be? That's no, but harder. Yeah. Yes, I, I agree. But therefore, if I wanted to make my instrument sounded like yours, or yours wanted to make sound like mine, I'd know what, what, what areas uh, uh, I'd got to attack to do so. Yes, I think I could make mine sound like your home, to. but I don't think I could make your VM sound like the Titian. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, is, there, is there nobody else, no real people out there who've got a question? I'm checking. I don't, I, don't, really yeah. I don't see any raised hands. Okay, so... Hi there. Uh, I'll speak instead of writing. It's Andrew. Andrew. Turn on your camera. Um, sorry. Uh, is the uh, second is the uh, microphone on the on the hammer necessary? Strictly speaking, if you really want to get dirty. If you really want to get dirty, you, you can just have, hit it with the end of a, of a pencil, uh, and, and you'd get you'd get the same information that that it wouldn't be um, necessarily reproducible from time to time, depending on how you hit hit the thing. But I think it would certainly give you where the peaks were. Exactly. So so, so you could certainly as a, as a very simple way of actually measuring your where where your resonances are. And and uh, and certainly at the, for in the signature mode region, just a simple tap with a hat with with a, with a pencil would do that, and you'd see immediately using George's software or in fact other commercial software, I suspect, that right. you could record. And it would do the same thing. Right. Very good. Alan, I'm holding in front of the the computer camera the small microphones that I have been using. That seem to work very, very well. I well, that's I what I'm here. From, these I got them from eBay, and they were unbelievably cheap. Exactly. If if, if you buy fifty of them, I, it, it, it costs about ten. No, I know exactly. That's what I do. So, Dennis, can you show one more time the name of the thing? Well, got it. Thank you. But if you go onto eBay, you you will find lots of adverts. Um, uh, the the cheapest ones come from China, as you can see, because that's where they're all made, and they're made for um, mobile telephones and cars, uh, car um, uh, collision type detection, and that's why they're so cheap. 
And um, uh, if you want them quickly, you have to get them from someone European who have bought a hundred of them and sell them for, with a markup of about five. Um, and they're more expensive, but they come quickly. Um, you have to wait a long time um, from things from China. No, typically a couple of months. The important part I have found with these is not the quality so much, of course, that's always important, but the diameter of the microphone so you can get it through the F hole. Yeah, that, that, that's why on the violin I use six millimeter ones. That's what um, this is. And I, get, and I go into it. Uh, Dennis, do you, do you use this method then? I, I use it daily. I, I, uh, I've been using it um, basically for trying to get better at bridge tuning on cellos. Um, but then I, I agree with you that uh, to, to find out why is the instrument so bad, they'll put it inside and uh, the, the modes are not what you would expect. But then as you put in a new bass bar or something, then magically, all of a sudden, all these modes start to come together exactly as you have said. So I use it as an initial evaluation of an instrument that I get in, not just the thickness of the plates and, and how stiff the top and the back feel to the hand, but what's happening on the inside. And if it's really bad, you can see it immediately and it takes five minutes, but I, I've been using Audacity and I'm hoping that um, I can get uh, George to help me put his software on my computer be, so I can look at different plots at the same time. I, I'm kind of a computer dunce. I'm very good at pharmacy and pharmaceuticals, but when it comes to a computer, <laughs> I'm not that good. <laughs> In that case, for this purpose, I think Chris Rogers' software from Oberlin is easier to use. Because if you just do, for doing some radiation measurement, it's much more simple. You have less options, but for doing this, it's, it's easier. I will send you the link in the ah, chat. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a question to both Colin and George? Uh, what would be the simplest way to um, multiply the plot you get from that kind of system uh, with F squared? You could do it in George's software, I'm sure. Yes, you can. Yeah. I'll call you. Okay. You mean, you mean like uh, for moving between um, accelerants and um, well, it was mobility just Colin and displacement? Was explaining, Colin was explaining the difference between the levels of the A0 to the B1 minus and the B1 plus, and he was saying that you'd have to, you'd have to introduce this multiplication of F squared to be able to, to get to... Uh, in the, get... Just in the signature mode region. Ah. In fact, what, what one wants, in fact, is a, a function that starts off as F squared and, and that's uh, and then becomes um, more or less constant uh, at around about a kilohertz. It'd be oh. very easy for George to put a filter like that and have it available. Oh. But in, uh, in FRF overlay, you have the option you could say create a vector in uh, by saving uh, an F FRF as um, a CSV file, then change the values, like you, you can put in the uh, values of the frequency squared or any other function you like, then you import it back yeah. in and multiply but you, one by another. So you can yeah, do but, it without, but that, without but any what, hard code. What in that range? But that, that, that requires, that's post-processing. Um, yeah. it, it's not done instantaneously. If I wanted a ready tool, just to make it easy so that well, you, you did internal yes. and wanted to convert it into um, um, a, a radiation one, it would be very easy to approximate to it by doing a function that was uh, it went up as F and then went across like this, either square or, or uh, with a curve to it. I could do it. Yes, all, all those things are possible. I mean, they can be, they can yeah. be hard coded. The problem is you have to protect people to some extent against uh, doing something silly, so, so applying one of those weightings when they're making another measurement. Yeah. So that makes the, from the um, code writer's point of view, these are the hardest parts of it, is to yeah. make an interface that stops people doing something daft. I understand that. But yeah. otherwise, this is easy. 
Um, but I don't, I wouldn't, I could do it post processing uh, because I'm only interested in making impulse response measurements of big double bases. So uh, it, it would easy, be easy for me to do it afterwards. Uh, yeah. Well, as I said, it's so ideally you know, suited. Yeah. If I want to do measurements of any sort of type, um, the internal sound measurements give you something to do with the actual radiated sound, which is much more difficult to do um, with radiation measurements. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's happening inside the double base, it's easy to do. Um, and it's giving you different information from the admittance. And it, in my view, it's worth having. Okay, I think. Um, okay. Just talk to me, talk to me some other time, and I'll, I'll explain how, how you can do all of these things. Can I ask you one more thing, Colin? I missed probably the position of the microphone inside the, the box, your preferred position for the measurement. My you... preferred po yeah. yeah. The measurements that I talked about today were entirely made um, at the center, um, what I call the acoustic center of the instrument which is in the middle and sort of in the geometric middle. And it's roughly, op it is opposite the F hole notches roughly but on the, on the center longitudinal axis, because it th there gets rid of a large signal from the sloshing mode, the A1 mode of the air going backwards and forwards inside the instrument. And there are very few, re there's very few um, internal air resonances then um, in low frequency, the low frequency range, the next one is only at 1.2 kilohertz. You've only got the, you've only got the, the breathing mode, the, the one that gives rise to the Helmholtz, and then the next one is right up in the kilohertz range that it couples into. And it's only those that couple into that mode that are going to be strongly excited. But I, uh, what, what the sort of thing I'm doing at the moment, of course, is doing it in different positions because I can look purposely to see um, how, um, what happens when you put it, for example, in the lower bouts and, um, and put it transverse across the lower bouts. So you excite now the, the mode that goes backwards and forwards like that across in, in the lower bouts. And that's going to be related, in fact, to what the, the plates are doing when they're radiating energy like that. So it's telling you information about other modes of the violin as well. But so, you, so, Collins, do I do yes. I understand that your microphone is lying on the back of the instrument inside? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so it's actually touching the back. Thank it's you. It's touching the back, but 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 um, I I measure very carefully, obviously, um, how, because I can then seal the microphone off and find out how much signal is is coming off um, from the vibrations. And, right. I and you take the you take your internal magnet off. Yeah. No, no, I'm, uh, I can take two identical um, uh, microphones, um, both and I can mount them in the same way on the back plate in the same position. And I, one of them, I can leave the, the ceiling off, off the front of them. So I'm just seeing the sound pressure. And the other one will be measuring the, the sound, the, the acceleration of the plates. And I can see how those two signals will vary. And I say that's, that's, a, that's a that, difference that I do. That's, that's okay. slightly different than what you've outlined. Oh. I mean, your, your diagram for, for building that rig doesn't include the microphone on the outside. No, 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 there's no, 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 I do, I do apologize. Um, uh, if I, it's not, it's another magnet on the outside. The other magnet, you've got the magnet on the microphone on the inside, that, that is resting on the back plate with yes. another with another with another magnet behind. Just hold on a second. Um, find some magnets. But there's no accelerometer on the outside of the instrument at the back. Is that true? Uh, Jason, the uh, magnet on the outside is just to hold the whole fixture. Just for the position, but yeah. that that mass is left in place while you make the measurements. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here we have. 
Um, the, 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 the microphone's going to go down here. I might put another magnet on the other side. I can move it around. Right. right. Okay. And, but you okay. leave the magnet attached while you make the measurement. Absolutely. Yes, no, okay. don't, don't, don't release it. It's, it's there. It's just permanent. Um, these small magnets, they're, they're less than half a gram or something like that each. They're nearly a mine. And it's a, it's a wonder. Uh, and, and that's a lovely method, of course, to seeing what the effect will be for adding some extra mass in different places. Uh, all right. Um, uh, so it's like gluey experiments where you put little strips and things on here. Here you put extra mass on. The, the gluey things are mostly bending. These are mass. So you can see the different effects of both. So you are leaving the magnet on the outside. Uh, Sorry? The, you're leaving the magnet uh, on the outside of the back. Uh, Absolutely. In the yeah. 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 No, it's, it's, um, it's incredibly convenient. I mean, George has used it too. And George has ma mapped out, in fact, the, 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 when I showed you the computer um, variations of pressure um, from the various modes, George has done that actually in practice. And, and so uh, you only need two points roughly to map out. Um, sorry? The, 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 the you only need about 32 different microphone positions. Yeah, quite. Inside to map out kilohertz. Yeah. Uh, because the, 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 but of course you're looking at you're looking at the interaction of the air modes with the with the cavity walls, which is why sometimes things like the A1 type longitudinal dipole. Uh, shows up again at um, you know much higher frequencies, sometimes another two or even three times. But uh, on, on the mass, like say a half, adding half a gram to the bridge is quite significant. But uh, half half a gram added to the back is much less of an intervention. The sound of the instrument. Of course, if you want to know, you can do it. Just play the instrument with the magnets there or not. But I think you find, you know, on masses to the bridge, like, you know, some people are able to detect as little as 0.1 of a gram added to the top of the bridge. But I think um, those sorts of masses add, added to the back will, will not really be audible. It's actually a very easy step from doing Collins measurement to uh, to, to mapping all, all of the air modes. Right. As a as a starting um, model analysis task, that's quite a good quite a good one to do. Yeah. 